welcome you. Uh, it's time to get started. Um, I'm Cliff Lynch. I'm the director of the Coalition for Networked Information, and I'll be introducing this session very briefly. Um, so uh, you've joined us for one of the project briefing sessions for the start of week two of the CNI uh, fall 2020 virtual member meeting. Uh, this week is focused on organizational and professional kinds of issues. And uh, we have a really timely presentation here. Um, a couple of mechanical things. We're recording this session. Um, there is, uh, and it will be subsequently available. There is closed captioning if you want it. There is a chat box and feel free to use the chat um, uh, to introduce yourself, to share thoughts as we go along. There's also a Q&A box. You can use that to pose questions for our speakers at any point. Uh, what we're gonna do is have two presentations and uh, we're gonna take a, uh, Lauren will lead off. We'll take a very short um, pause between the two and field any questions that there are before moving on to Scott's. Um, I think that's about, and, and those question sessions will be moderated by Diane Goldenberg Hart from CNI. I think that's about all of the mechanics uh, that I need to touch on. Uh, we have two speakers today, uh, Lauren Michael, who will lead off. She's from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And uh, Scott Yokel, who is from Harvard University, will finish up the presentation. Just briefly, um, this is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. Those of you who are CNI regulars will undoubtedly have heard me say more than once that one of our great challenges at present is to do what we spent the last quarter of a century doing with instructional technology, to professionalize it and find a place for it inside our institutions. And the challenge now is to do much the same thing with research support, research computing and data. And I'm delighted to be able to bring you today some of the folks who are involved with an organization called CARC that you're gonna hear more about in a minute um, that are on the front lines of leading this um, move towards professionalization and institutionalization of these uh, critical roles. Uh, I just finally want to note that this presentation and the presentation that took place just before it at two o'clock on benchmarking research computing and data um, capabilities um, really, I believe, form a very um, good pair of sessions. So if you didn't see the one at two, I'd urge you to go back and look at the video of that as your time permits. And with all of that lead up, um, thank you so much, Lauren and Scott, for being here. Over to you, Lauren. Thank you, Cliff. That was a great introduction. Um, and as Cliff mentioned, I'm, I'm Lauren. I'm at UW-Madison. And uh, beyond the roles that keep me busy generally, um, at the UW and also with the Open Science Grid, I also have various roles within CARC, um, which is a research computing and data community that we hope to speak with you about today, as well as diving into some efforts within that organization um, to support professional development and to help institutionalize and formalize uh, research computing and data roles as a profession. So Scott will take that second part. I'll first discuss um, what CARC is, how it formed, and um, how we support professional development through the People Network. Um, so CARC, which stands for Campus Research Computing Consortium, is a grassroots organization of professionals that uh, operate, advocate for, and advance the state of campus research cyber infrastructure, um, and also do the same for associated professions uh, relevant to campus cyber infrastructure. And if you're not as familiar with the term cyber infrastructure, think research computing and data, which is really the terminology that we tend to use on the CARC website, um, where we mean to be fairly inclusive of anybody who supports, operates, um, not just computing and data infrastructure, um, but uh, human support 
for researchers who take advantage of that infrastructure, whether that be computational clusters, um, data storage and creation services, um, even really data scientists and people who work with software um, that works on data for research. And um, CARC kind of pulling together from a history of collaborations and projects among this community of individuals, some of them leaders of, of campus services, um, really does sort of several things. One, it provides a professional community whereby individuals who work in research cyber infrastructure can learn from each other in what we call the people network that I'll describe in more detail that's we think of as sort of an, a virtual ongoing conference. Um, we also um, provide infrastructure like email lists, Google groups, similar to what we use in the people network um, to organize members of the community into working groups that, that have been identified with specific objectives or products that could benefit the greater community. Um, what you'll hear about later from Scott is some of our work on professionalization and workforce development for roles relevant to research, computing, and data. Um, in the previous session, Cliff already mentioned that there was a presentation um, on F, um, outcomes of our working group on developing a capabilities model for institutions to assess the sort of state of computing and data services and capabilities on their campus. Um, we have other working groups, but another one um, that has had sort of frequent reinstatements of sort of just surveying the research IT and research cyber infrastructure ecosystem is, is a working group that has executed um, CARC sponsored workshops, uh, surveys of research cyber infrastructure services, um, and there was a paper submitted um, to the PERC conference, Practice and Experience in Advanced Research Computing, that had a snapshot of that ecosystem. Um, though we have other working groups that focus on things like the CARC Charter, et cetera. And then we also support the formation of interest groups um, that might lead to objectives or working groups, but can otherwise just be a way for individuals to discuss issues relevant to the ecosystem. And you can see in this diagram here that we've sort of demonstrated um, this set of activities. We have a logistics team that really is just in charge of maintaining some of that common infrastructure like the Google groups and email lists that support um, the people network and these working and interest groups. And I'll talk a bit more about the people network now, um, which includes um, several tracks that professionals in this field might ascribe to and therefore engage with. Um, Scott, can we go back to the principles and charter? Yes. So um, a few things that we like to communicate about CARC um, that are really sort of built into the principles of how CARC operates and, and how it supports community activities. Um, we try to be very inclusive and open. We think of all of these activities as community owned, owned by the community of professionals themselves and not say by CARC, therefore they're open, therefore the products that, that we put out can be used and taken up by anybody. Um, we try to facilitate and span boundaries. There are a number of other organizations in the research computing and data space that either represent professional development and community building opportunities. Um, uh, and so we tend to partner with those and, and try to make sure that we're representing everybody who, who touches or thinks of themselves as being involved in research computing and data. Next slide, please. Um, and so in our work with the People Network, you know, we started by looking across, you know, some existing communities of, of professionals, but that were maybe subsets of the research computing and data community. And we were thinking, you know, if you needed, when we need to pursue something that's relatively near cutting edge, where do these individuals turn for professional development? Um, a downside currently, um, I think, for this field is that there are some formalized trainings, et cetera, that, that tend to be more oriented toward enterprise IT and that don't necessarily um, target research cyber infrastructure specifically. And so what a lot of us do is that we um, talk to our friends, we go to conferences, and really in reality, we do a, a lot by doing. We learn a lot by doing. And, and by doing research even in cyber infrastructure alongside running cyber infrastructure that supports research. Um, but conferences are kind of generally only once per year. And there certainly has been quite a bit of success in sort of email centered or call centered communities that we thought we might bring to this inclusive community. And so next slide. 
um, we started the People Network, representing different sort of facets or what we've called facings, um, which Scott will elaborate on. And this is how, you know, one of the frameworks that prior work and, and sort of workshops by members of this community have, have kind of put together to express the different areas of the profession. So there are individuals who are researcher facing, meaning they do consulting, facilitation, outreach, and training. Um, some people who run computing and data systems, including um, hardware and network components, people who are data facing, um, including librarians, people doing analysis, preservation. Um, there are leaders, um, there's a software facing um, entity within these professional roles as well. Um, we haven't executed that track yet um, within the people network, partially because there sort of already isn't a community that we collaborate with called the Research Software Engineers Community or RSEs that you may have heard of. So next slide. Um, to date, um, where each of these communities has an email list, monthly calls, and a couple of coordinators who don't really lead or own, but um, just help each track um, or sub-community organize themselves, um, this is the sort of breakdown of membership. So we've got hundreds of institutions participating. Um, not all of them are from EDU. Of course, we have some email addresses that are, are Gmail, but we're sort of trying to represent with email domains maybe the, something close to um, the number of organizations with professionals participating. And we've had um, quite a few people go out of their way to sign in to call documents. Um, we also record a significant number, nearly all of these monthly calls um, whenever we can and put them on YouTube. So there are quite a few views there and, and Zoom connections as well. And next slide. Yep, this one. Um, I've gathered, if you're interested in perhaps joining the People Network, um, topics that have come up within each community that they've decided they wanted to discuss or that one of their community members thought they could present their own story on. Um, the format for these calls is not always like a one speaker presentation. Sometimes it's a group discussion with absolutely no slides. Um, and really the, each track decides um, what topics they wanna to discuss and that sort of thing. And then there's also quite a bit of email chatter before and after these discussions, um, the main people network list that's inclusive of all of these uh, track lists um, is where a lot of people also post job positions. So if you're looking to promote those or to be learning about positions, the people network can, can help you just with that as well. Um, we've got a number of calls coming up, including an end of year party in December, where most of the tracks are not having calls in December given um, conflicts with the winter holidays, and you can learn about those on our events page. And at this point, we'll pause just briefly to take uh, maybe a couple of questions about the People Network before Scott discusses a bit more about professional development or development of the profession, I mean. Thanks, Lauren. If you have questions, um, please enter them in the Q&A box. Um, I just quickly wanted to ask Lauren, is there an, are there opportunities for students to interface with professionals through CARC? Yes, currently we don't have anything that would restrict students from participating in the people network. And, and we certainly even have discussed in some of the communities, I think one of the topics actually was student employees. Okay. Um, so we do have students who are engaging. I think that's an area where we could engage more. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions come in through the Q&A right now. So thank you for taking that break. Yep, we can do more at the end. Thank you so much, Lauren. <clears throat> so I'm Scott Yokel at Harvard University. Um, I've been engaged with CARC, I guess, since the beginning. And Lauren and I and a few others uh, across a couple of institutions were part of the um, ACI REF program, which was the, an NSF grant called Advanced Cyber Infrastructure Research Education and Facilitation. Um, and so a lot of the like understanding of how to operate as a virtual organization um, started out of that kind of space and then CARC formed shortly at the end of that grant. And um, it's kind of interesting now that the norm is to have these conferences and these conversations all over Zoom. Um, we were all really well practiced at it and had all these skills that we already built um, from that. And so one of the things that we all struggled with and it became interesting at that point of the end of the ACI REF program was that the concept of a facilitator as a position was actually rel relatively new and we were starting to see whole organizations like create and want to have something like that um, 
So we started to talk about why having professional, like why do we need to professionalize and think more uh, about research computing and data? Um, some of the top things are there's a national shortage for these people. Um, there's national shortage for IT in general, but there's especially a shortage. Most of us go through long searches to find people to fill these positions. Um, there's little awareness that this is even a career. There are so many postdocs and graduate students that, that are in the modeling and simulation space that don't realize they could continue to stay in academia um, and transition into this, this kind of support role in, in research um, and not, you know, not choose other paths. Um, there's also a high employee turnover, which is hard. We're in the business of educating people at university. We do it also within our, st our staffing because we are doing something relatively new. Um, and so those people like in the Boston area, my, my employees don't have to move anywhere <laughs> to take a job at Google or, at, you know, or any of those types of places. They can just go down the street in Cambridge. Um, it's also hard because it's hard to train them as we talked a little about that before. Um, in our structure at our universities, developing and promoting them is a challenge because there are not, there's just two classes of position, like an entry level class and, and then the senior position. Anything beyond that was management, which is not always the best path forward for some people. Um, <clears throat> it's also a very distinctive um, occupation from administrative or enterprise IT in the fact that um, those, those positions tend to have um, a, a vertical depth and, and less horizontal breadth to them. Um, and they tend to create things that are more of a utility for the campus instead of trying to craft solutions alongside of the customer, like the end user. So for us, for researchers. Um, and, and there's a lot of times when the things that we are trying to deploy are unique. They're not, there's no manual on how to install that software. There's no, there's not very much knowledge historically about how to run that, you know, file system or something that's fairly new. So that led us to wanting to do a lot more. Um, so there was a series, so I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of history of a couple of years. There was a series of meetings that was part of a research coordination network that started, I think, in 2017. Um, and a group of us, about 30 or so, director of research computing and a bunch of uh, uh, organizational sociologists started to talk about what does professionalization mean? Um, so in the library, since you've gone through a, the very formal sense of it, you've got all the way down these steps, right, to create formal um, graduate programs in schools of, of library of information science and stuff like that. Um, in research computing, or what we might say research IT, as you'll see a couple of different times, we'll change the terms. It looks like probably steps one, two, three would be nice as a place to, um, to, to hit at this point, where we get to the point where we, we organize what is the knowledge base, we disseminate it as a practice, um, and, and we start to organize who the people are and organize like what management looks like, what individual contributors look like, and stuff like that. Um, to go beyond that would, would make it a much more rigid um, kind of situation where we need something to be continually updating and changing every couple of years to go along with the path of the research. So we think of ourselves as kind of stopping probably after step three there. So we've had an, a, a working group that's kind of keeps revolving every year um, and coming out with different products that's a part of supporting professionalization. Um, and the goal is really is to, to develop and disseminate frameworks and approaches to, to use with institutional leaders in HR, in IT, in research, so that we can elevate research computing data as a distinct and highly valued career path. Um, that's one thing that we look at the libraries and the libraries have done that historically and done a really good job. There's, a, there's, a, there's an elevation of a librarian at a lot of universities that is similar and has similar tracks as, as professorships, which, is, which kind of shows that, um, that value. Um, the value that we can also provide is attracting, retaining, diversifying um, the talent that we need to support research computing and data, right, and develop new practices in that space. So in, in 2018, we got together and, and tried to think about these things and write up a document. It was kind of like a, a um, career guide about um, and, and define what are the roles and responsibilities of these jobs. Um, so we got together and learned about what some of our colleagues had done thus far in that space. Um, we developed a flexible framework um, and wrote a, a, about a 30-page paper on that internally. 
um, we vetted the concept of, of these different facings um, and they actually held. That was one of the things that we were interested to see come out. Those, um, those all solidified and everybody agreed we should stay with this. Um, so then we wrote different sections defining what those were. Um, and then the other thing is, is to be able to understand the way to communicate <clears throat> the differences in the facings and different levels of, of interest and needs of different staffing and understanding that we have lots of varieties of different institutions, small, large, private, public, you know, from EPSCOR states and from not. And, and we need to understand how to build a framework across that, all of that um, together. And then the next step that came out of that was the result that we needed some also um, an actual framework that we could use with HR, like the structures that, that are in place, we need to be able to provide them those things um, and not come from the fact that we're just developing them individually at our own institution, but it's something that's being used across all of, of the US in the academic space. On top of that, that workshop, some themes came out that have resonated and continue to resonate today, as you'll see get a, a slide towards the end, um, the idea that we co-create or partner with the researchers uh, to come up with solutions. Um, career paths are important, and we don't have that most. The idea that there's an increasing amount of things that are just digital in nature now that is causing what used to be for us mostly high performance computing, very centric to that, it just keeps growing. And now we find ourselves overlapping and, 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 and doing a lot of work and partnering across campus with data scientists and with digital librarians and other, other communities. Um, I talked about the status part as well already, the value um, that the, the people, the staff would like to, to have and be known for. The terminology, as you've seen in our slides thus far, the term cyber infrastructure really comes from the National Science Foundation has an Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure, which supports a lot of our uh, institutions as far as for grants. So, but we use the term research IT, we use the term research computing and data. It's hard when we keep using different terms to mean different things. So it's important to um, understand and define these terminology. So fast forward one year past that. <clears throat> so if you go to the products page, you can see the 2018 um, <clears throat> document that we created. In 2019, we set forth to create, I uh, led a working group to create an actual HR uh, framework. Um, and what was nice is we had a good collection of, of participants in the working group. Um, so we had some people that were directors, we have people who are managers, we have individual contributors, we had people from HR that support the IT groups, both from Harvard and University of Florida. Um, and in six weeks time, we went through this process where we'd come up with a skeleton draft and email it out on the call, we'd review it and we just kept doing that. And we'd go each week through each series, um, which I'll show you in a second which are the facings to create actual job descriptions. So I obviously can't show you some like what is 15 pages of an Excel sheet in a presentation, but I'll try to give you an overview of what a little bit of structure that I've learned about uh, that happens in HR. Um, there are at the top level, the highest level there's job function. So information technology, research, um, Libraries normally is a, is a job function. Um, you might have museum or collections. You could have athletics. Like those are the top level functions. Um, and so at an institution, research computing and data would normally fall either in the IT technology space or in purely research, right? Um, but underneath that, so like in this example, information technology, there's IT infrastructure, there's networking, there's IT infrastructure, say for cloud. Um, but there is no IT infrastructure or positions there that, that describe really what happens in uh, research computing and data professionals. What we really needed was a, a unique job family that was just research computing. And so that's what we, we set forth to create. Um, and in that, there are job series, um, and that's where the facings come in. Um, <clears throat> and I'll break these down. So if we just took systems facing, the individual contributor roles, a lot of us just had two of these prior to this, this model. And in this model, we thought it was good to have um, a systems professional one through five. Most of us, our current staff fall into the category two and three in this space. Um, and we don't have the way to just, didn't have the way to describe a ladder going beyond um, what would be the individual contributor role that was equivalent to a manager role. And so we were losing a lot of staff at that moment because they would become 
technically more capable in the systems role. They would take on more responsibility. They would broaden their horizon for the number of types of things that they would become you know, experts on. They wouldn't just only have to know about systems. They would also have to understand how researchers use the systems and have all this kind of stuff. So having this, it gives us the ability to have what we would consider like, if these were engineers, this would be at the level four, like a lead engineer or a principal engineer, or principal architect. Those things also translate well to what happens in, say, like Google and Intel and these types of, of, of industries um, that are in the technology space. And so we have this one through five um, in each of these different facings. Um, and then you can see how they're equivalent now to the manager. So this could be like a, a senior manager position, junior or senior manager, or you might have an associate director, depending on what, but you can see there's a couple of levels. So Within the position itself and in the framework itself, these are all the components that are requirements for, for most every HR uh, business title, the core duties and the additional qualification and skills are the parts that are you have the most flexibility and then we encourage the individual institutions to adopt and, and, and change as they need. But the part that is really important that we try to keep um, static is the actual job title. Um, which are just these that I showed before, um, and the job summary, and the way in which there are grade levels. The thing that's the most important is the language that we use to describe how one goes from levels one, two, three, and up, up, the, up the ladder is really important. They're really important key terms that we learn from HR to, to keep in there, um, to keep the ladder going correctly. So um, if you go to the products page, you can go to the job family matrix and see that information and see the full details of. So I encourage you to go there. <clears throat> a couple, couple more slides about what came out of that working group. I've already talked about the non-managerial career paths, the distinctness from enterprise for IT. One concept is that in enterprise IT, as you go up the ladder, you typically become more specialized. Um, you might become the you know, architect of, of networking or the architect of Oracle financials or something like that for university. In, in research computing, you get much broader. You have to know and be able to traverse across lots of different disciplines, lots of different kinds of technology um, and lead in that space. Also, research computing is really just designed for those that are in that space. There are also gonna be other people in your department that support you, um, business operations and so like that. Those are in other families. So, um, and then there was a lot of argument about education versus experience, and we really landed on the side of experience and that we describe the number of years of experience where education counts as some of those years of experience as the as important thing. It also keeps from alienating people um, from applying to positions where they think their education may not qualify. Um, in software and data, it turned out we, we decided to combine those for HR purposes. The roles and responsibilities of software and data uh, professionals supporting research community are really well aligned. It's just that their skill that they're using to do those roles and maybe the domain in which they're doing those is, is different. So it didn't, you didn't really necessarily need a distinct separate series for those. Um, and one note is that when you implement something locally, you have to be flexible. So what, some of the hard things to decide on are where do you put data sciences? Are they research function or the technology function? You need to think about how that benefits them. Um, bioinformatics, bioinformatics, as an example. I really encourage people to think, do they, is the primary responsibility of a person research, like independent research and collaborating with other researchers, or is it providing a technology service? And that's kind of where you can make the distinction between the two. Um, <clears throat> and at Harvard, it happened to be the, the leadership facing type place is it's it's a whole other category. It doesn't fall into the framework. You will get pushback when you implement something and you have individual contributors where there are very few or none. They don't want to implement those categories um, in HR. But if you don't have them, you don't have a career path for people internally within your institution. Um, and then just recently in 20, uh, 20 here, just a couple of months ago, we had 100 participants um, across three webinars where we talked about all the different types of things you know that we've talked about thus far um, and a couple outcomes from that um, is that we really really need hr job families which was good that we already had done some of that work 
the idea that we can define career arcs, um, that we need you know, a good understanding of compensation for positions across um, the landscape of academia, diversity, equity, inclusion, like what is, what is our current state of that? How can we recruit and do better at that? Um, and so one thing that's nice is that at CARC, you know, completely not running that, that workshop, that was an NSF funded workshop that Purdue hosted. We already had in place some ideas to do this. We were just starting uh, a working group with the, an annual census for research computing and data professionals. Um, Patrick, um, who talked before us about the um, capabilities model, career arcs is a working group that he is, is getting started. Um, we want to continue doing work of, you know, taking the best of training and workforce that exists in different institutions and kind of like centralize that information, um, especially working with like graduate students and undergraduates as they are the next kind of workforce into this space. Um, and then other things like providing leading practice to support RCD as an organization, like how do we help support managers and how do we help grow their capabilities. So. Hopefully that gives you a good overview of um, type of activities we've done to help professionalize research computing and data. Um, excited to answer any questions you have in that space and please check out the products page. Um, you can see a number of different products we've created. Always welcome your feedback on those products. Thank you, Scott. That was a really interesting overview. Um, appreciate that. And if you have questions, please go ahead and type those into the Q&A. Um, we'll be happy to take those now. We are a little bit past time. I apologize for that. Um, but while we're waiting to see if we've got some questions, I believe Cliff has a question. Yeah, I do actually. And um, uh, this, is, this is a little bit um, off your primary topic, but I would really welcome your views on this, Lauren and Scott. So CNI has done a lot of work over the past six months or so on issues around research continuity and research robustness. And a significant piece of that is about setting up um, experimental apparatus for remote operation and um, uh, more automated operation. So you don't need as much physical presence in, um, in labs. Uh, and that includes sort of core instrumentation that may be shared among lots of other projects. Where do the people who do that kind of work fit in? Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable about thinking of them as research computing and data, but I don't know where else to put them either. Yeah, it sounds like you're talking about people who operate instrumentation. Well, who, who instrumentation. design and interface yeah. and networks and things like that. Yeah, so we've actually, um, CARC is part of a discussion that came out of um, the NSF workshop that Scott mentioned. And, and I've been part of those discussions, but there are several communities across research computing and data of professionals like research software engineers, campus champions, some of the other collaborators on one of my earlier slides. And um, we're getting together to talk about a potential community of these communities, so sort of one sort of unifying body. And we just discussed this issue of, of people who support instrumentation, who touch quite a bit of computing and data, but that may not be all of what they do. And I think similar to what Scott described for data scientists, there are perhaps different reasons at different facilities or different campuses where sometimes it will be advantageous or more logical, um, just in terms of the work that a particular person does to think of them more as research cyber infrastructure. And to that extent, uh, we agree that a community of communities for research computing and data should include those individuals and should otherwise have the higher level objective of including emerging areas of research cyber infrastructure, where I think automation, like you mentioned, and instruments and, and other cyber infrastructure tied to instrument facilities is extremely relevant. Yeah, so one example that's probably been at the best is in bioinformatics, right? There are, we've carved off this community of people who are very technically minded, but also still in that, very much in that domain of, of research. Um, that bridge the space between an instrument that somebody who's a geneticist who creates data, then that data has to be processed to be usable to make decisions and make discovery. 
what's hard is there are a lot of other places that, especially in microscopes that are like scanning all sorts of things from materials to cells and stuff where we don't have that kind of framework, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think also as digitization spreads across, like we see this at Harvard in the library system where they're, they've automated the way to scan materials that have been handwritten but they don't have a way to automate using machine learning and stuff to transcribe and digit like actually make actual text out of that kind of stuff. And that's where there's a lot to be learned about where the problems are and get the right people together. And you have to have kind of an end-to-end -end thought about it. Like where is the data being created? Where is it being touched along the way? And where do we intervene on the other end on the systems end to make sure that we're providing things that work well? Because if we just let the person who's creating the data then do the whole pipeline, they don't have the visibility of how perhaps poorly they're using the computing and, and storage resources on the other end, right? And so they could do things in a much more performant way or, or do ways you know, that would make more sense. Um, so that is a challenge. Thank you. That, that's, that's a very helpful perspective on that which I've been puzzling over lately. Thank you so much. Back to you, Diane. All right. Thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Lauren and Scott, for fielding that question. And Cliff, thanks for the question. I don't see uh, any questions in the Q&A, and we are um, well past time. We have another session coming up in about 20 minutes. Um, so I will uh, thank everyone for joining us and a special thanks to Lauren and Scott and uh, hope to see you at another uh, CNI breakout during our fall 2020 meeting. Be well, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Many thanks. Thank you.